Hi. So welcome back from lunch. So we're just going to take about three minutes of your time, if we could have your attention, to bring, I don't know how many of you know that um, a cultural center wa in Gaza was bombed on August 9th. And um, we're just going to show you like 30 seconds of a little video about this campaign that we're working on to rebuild the cultural center. So if you could just play like, and I'll, I'll say, I'll say when to stop. Okay, thanks. You can just fade it out. This is on YouTube. You can see it. Um, this was the Al Mashal Cultural Center in Gaza. G can you grab one of these because they're tied up? Um, and uh, and we we it doesn't work. You have to turn it on. Turn it. They're pressing. There you okay. Go. See? Hi. Hi. <laughs> so um, I, we just wanted to let you know, uh, if you didn't know that this happened on August 9th uh, of this of 2018. Also, um, I wrote a small article about it on HowlRound, um, so uh, our wonderful HowlRound uh, that's called From Gaza City to the Golden Gate, because I'm living in California now, so that was a clever title. Um, in my company, The Heat Collective, and I've got cards here, there's a link to the whole campaign for the Cultural Center there, which is connected um, to AS Theatre in London and Ashtar Theatre in Palestine. Yes. Um, this is the third cultural place in one week that was bombarded. They also um, bombarded uh, the National uh, Library in Gaza and a visual art center. And that was the theater that hosted um, about um, 670 children who studied dance and theater in that space. So, um, and there were no excuse for that. So what we're trying to do, as uh, Jessica mentioned, we're trying to rebuild the place um, with, a British, uh, with the help of a British company called A to Z. Of course, online, there are more, much more information for you t and if you are interested to know, but... And you can sign up and join, and join us. It's right now just we're gathering uh, theater makers from all over the world to join the, the, uh, the plan to somehow help to rebuild this. And we have many ideas, but we won't go into them now. But we'd love you to, to join us. And um, the Heat Collective website, www.theheatcollective.org, has a whole thing on the Gaza Cultural Center, a whole drop-down thing, which gives you links to how to get involved. Thank so you. Thank you. On? Yeah. Thank you, Iman. And... Um, Jessica, and I think it's been said, but just that Oranges and Stones comes up tonight at 9.15, and please make sure to see Ashtar Theater's beautiful work that we've brought uh, here, thanks to Iman and Edward. Um, shifting, uh, shifting to um, really an extraordinary group of people that we have here, and I just want to, I think one of the things going on at this gathering um, is a a kind of connecting of a lot of dots and a spinning of a lot of different aspects of webs. And I think all webs and dots in the global theater uh, world over the last several decades in some way or another uh, lead one to Philip Arnaud. Um, <laughs> uh, Philip... I, I, this gathering wouldn't be happening, I think it's fair to say, because I wouldn't be here or know how to be doing any of this if it weren't for Philip. I uh, somewhat innocently 
close to a decade ago through Philip's generosity and his work with uh, Center for International Theater Development, which he founded uh, 27, 28 years ago, um, and th with the support of Trust for Mutual Understanding, which he's worked with deeply, I got to uh, go, go with him and the extraordinary Martha Kwanye um, uh, to Bulgaria on a sort of what was a first adventure. I had been interested in global theater. I had been doing some of this work, but the lab didn't exist. Um, and it was, uh, it was the beginning of something really, really hugely transformative for me as I came to understand more deeply the influence of, uh, of what Philip and Martha had done d distinctively from each other and with each other. Um, and uh, Philip, uh, so it's really meaningful that Philip has brought, and this is really, you know, these, these, this amazing next um, uh, group of artists to us. They, this was, this was um, not easy. They were in the middle of work in New York. Um, uh, this was an undertaking, and Philip, being the visionary he was, seeing that we were all gathered, found a way to say, let's make this happen together um, so we can share it. Um, if you don't know Philip's work, I just want to, it's too much to say, but I, I think it's meaningful that, um, m you know, I've been privileged to become part of the world of the International Theatre Institute. Many folks are here f connected to that world. Taiwo just arrived, and he's now the director of the Network for Emerging Arts, pro uh, Emerging Arts Professionals. It's just got renamed. Are you in the room, Taiwo? Um, uh, connect with uh, Taiwo. But the, but the, um, uh, but ITI um, is a, a world that Philip um, and Martha were leaders in for so long. Um, he had a 30, has had a 30 year relationship with it. And he is, I think it's meaningful uh, to note, was the 13th person awarded the ITI UNESCO World Theater Ambassador Award. Uh, one of the others was Wole Shanka, who we were privileged to have yesterday. So it's kind of extraordinary um, in this space in Washington right now to have uh, this kind of convergence. So anyway, I won't say too much more. Philip will introduce you to the other artists, but it's just a real honor to um, be here in the presence of um, Philip, who is a progenitor of so, so many of the kinds of relationships that we're trying to continue here. So welcome. Welcome, Philip, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to start right away. We're going to do this in two parts. Uh, each of them about 45 minutes. Uh, the first is to give you an update on the dumpster fire that is uh, Hungarian politics uh, that has changed immensely. I did a lecture tour in October with uh, a Hungarian critic, uh, and every day we had to change the topic because some new bad horrible news was coming from Hungary uh, and then when uh, I went to Europe I went to Hungary for three weeks with my buddy Howard Chalowitz and uh, uh, an associate uh, and Margaret Lawrence and when we got back in a very short period of time there were 13 feature articles in the New York Times on what was going on in Hungary. There were two uh, editorials, and there were three letters to the editor. There were major pieces in, uh, thanks, major pieces in uh, The Atlantic, um, The New Yorker, uh, and Howard's piece on that trip and how around. Since that time, there's been nothing. It's been really quiet. We've got our own dumpster fire here with nice shiny objects falling out of it every day to keep us not thinking about anything that's not happening right around our waist, I guess. But things don't seem to be getting any better. So what I asked was a good, an old friend of mine, Mati Gashbar, to sort of bring us up to date. 
to have some folks who've been in Hungary recently, Yuri Urnov, Russian director, uh, works at Woolley Wilma Project, Blair Rubel, uh, a Sovietologist, uh, for many years ran the Wilson Center, a board member of the Trust for Mutual Understanding. Wish I had the map to show you the 30 countries they work in, uh, but they've, they're one of the real anchors for those of us that are trying to make something happen between this country and that part of the world. Uh, and then, of course, Martin, uh, an actual Hungarian artist who's sitting here, and Martin uh, will be making the second part of this uh, situation, this uh, little first half. What we'd like to do is to at least have half the time of the 45 minutes, or now probably 41 minutes, open for dialogue and questions. Um, I think that's probably good enough. Let me just say. I'm, I'm just going to add the one person Phil didn't introduce um, because she'll dominate the program later is Daniela Topol, for those who don't know, from the Rattlestick Theater um, in New York, who's going to talk think. to you about the, yes. about the project with uh, Martin. Yes, she'll be the star of the second half. There you are. Uh, just, uh, I went to Eastern Europe in 1974 to do a project with Grotowski and never looked back. Uh, I went to Hungary 10 years later for a project, and this is 84, so it was still Soviet times. I then went back and did a second big six or seven year project with the independent companies there, and then moved on with a deep project with Yuri and some other folks in Russia. Finished that up in 2010, and was in Budapest the day of the election that put Orban and his folks in charge and have watched with uh, horror and sadness what's been happening there for 10 years. It's also a time when I tr kept trying to figure out how I could explain what we do or I do. And I came up with this very simple thing and it's held strong for me for the last 12 years is we show up, we witness, we help tell the story and we help take artists take next steps, first steps. And that will get amplified when we talk about this project in the second half. But Mate, can I give it to you? And will you bring us up to date? Thank, thank you, Philip. And uh, thanks for this great opportunity to be here with you. And thanks for your interest in this uh, topic, um, which is uh, compared to other stories and events that uh, ha have been uh, presented so far is absolutely not that dramatical because nothing has been bombarded. No one was taken out into the forest. So I feel a bit embarrassed, uh, you know, how to come up with this uh, story, which is um, rather the other way around. If you come to Budapest and if you uh, would like to spend some uh, sunny weekend, um, I can guarantee that you will have a great time and you will feel like in one of the most interesting and flourishing mm, place in uh, Europe, or for sure in Central Europe, um, because uh, it's, um, it's a very much, we are living in, in a theater, and it's a very uh, deeply politicized theater, so politics wanted to show off. And uh, I think what happened the last 10, 12 years shows that uh, in many ways, um, they succeeded and um, well taking an American reference it's all about dreams so I would say it, that those guys had their dreams and they made their dreams come true and this is something that uh, from a certain aspect you can really sense when you come to Budapest and just to illustrate mm, this how, how strong these dreams are and how importantly they influence what's going on just uh, a few miles from here next Monday Prime Minister Orban will be uh, received by President Trump and uh, this is an event that uh, he and his administration uh, have been preparing for years and this is a very dramatic moment <coughs> in the history in the newest history of our country because it will be 
presented and it could be performed in uh, in our local media and local public as uh, the biggest uh, acknowledgement of uh, of the policies and of the politics that uh, this administration administration uh, has been carrying out and i think that next week starting next week it will become even more hard uh, even harder for those of us who are absolutely uh, who are not signing up for this kind of uh, politics to, to deny it because he will come back from here with the biggest acknowledgement and the biggest endorsement one can have today in the free world. And Orban and this politics really help others who have big dreams uh, and who are loyal enough to deploy them to, uh, to see their dream come true. Uh, many of those articles Philip uh, just referred to were about an incredible tour of the National Opera to New York, uh, to the Metropolitan, Mm, it, uh, it took place uh, last November and it was really an unprecedented event because I want to talk about culture and cultural policies to you. Um, uh, two weeks tour of uh, 375 uh, artists and, and contributors to a tour of 15 concerts and uh, shows, opera, ballet concerts <coughs> at the uh, at the Metropolitan Opera and the Lincoln, uh, in the Lincoln Center and the Carnegie Hall, um, all paid by uh, by the Hungarian government. And when I uh, first I told Philip this story when we met in, in in Budapest, and Howard was also with them, they they didn't want to believe when I quoted the amount it it costed and the the budget the the Hungarian state invested in this endeavor in order to prove that everything is possible and if you want to buy yourself in the metropolitan you can do that it's just a question of intention and money and it costed something like seven million dollars to to make it happen uh, which is uh, the equal of the, the yearly budget of the national theater reviews were a yawn here and they were somehow rewritten when they were translated back in Budapest. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the, the reviews here were completely different. When I, when I read the, the, the reports in, in Budapest, I, I felt like reading in the archives of the 50s because it was a pure propaganda um, report about how everything was. And it's not just about, you know, whether people applauded or not, but it's, it's, it's the language, it's this, fierce willingness to prove that we worth more than, than, than anyone else and we finally showed it uh, in the most prestigious uh, scenes of, um, of, of the United States and we presented our national treasures to the American audience who would finally discover why is it so important for not only for us but uh, for, for the rest of the world as well. So this, this, this uh, incredible effort to prove that, that we are we are worthy and we will, we will show you that our national identity <coughs> expressed by, by the culture and by the, uh, the arts um, uh, will somehow be become much more present than it uh, had been ever before. And if it is possible, and <coughs> maybe it's also, so I have to add to, uh, to make the picture complete, um, because I think Hungary is one of the rare countries where we don't have to complain about funding and money. So um, um, this example also shows that there is money. There is a lot, uh, extremely lot of money uh, for, for almost anything because this amount, this seven million, were not taken away from other initiatives. It was just added as a sort of extra funding for this nice adventure. Uh, where not only the 375 artists could come, but also the half of the administration, starting by the uh, president of the country and all kind of uh, state secretaries and so on. Um, <coughs> and the, um, but this is not an accident. Um, just in a recent survey, I, I w which, w which came out uh, this March, uh, it was shown that uh, in the last three years, so between uh, 15 and, and uh, 17, the increase of the state investment into cultural affairs in the whole European, uh, Europe, European Union 
uh, was the highest in Hungary. So Hungary, proportionally to the GDP, invested three times more money in culture than the EU average. And with this core, uh, stand stood out as the first uh, country investing in culture in general. So, <coughs> good news, there is a lot of money. Uh, what, what is the, the, the bad news? That this money, of course, is distributed extremely unequally, and this money is uh, highly, extremely centralized. The same survey uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, if you compare the spendings on the state level and on the local levels, uh, yeah, the investments in culture, hu in Hungary, the central investment is the highest and the local investment is the, the, the lowest, which means that every, almost every fund or the, ma the majority of the funds are concentrated from directly from the state administration, which makes our, uh, makes, makes our system extremely rigid and very difficult to access it. To access, and on that point, I, I would like to to refer of all those of us for whom uh, to realize their dreams is pretty more difficult, um, because um, when uh, Orban came into power uh, the second time in 2010, uh, the aftermath of the uh, the elections, he he started to use the term of national the system of national collaboration. So he announced that this will be a new era in the Hungarian history, which will be called system of national collaboration. And they started by taking off. When you enter the country on, uh, on the road, uh, on the highway, uh, you will see just Hungary, and you, you, you won't never uh, again see Hung Republic of Hungary, because the word Republic was taken away. Uh, and it was just signed Hungary. And he very co uh, cautiously doesn't refer anymore to the Republican idea <coughs> of our state, although it's still written in the Constitution, which is not Constitution anymore, but uh, fundamental law, it is called. But uh, instead of the, the, the mm, uh, well, well known state form, he introduced this new form, the system of national collaboration. And I have to tell you that <coughs> nine years after, uh, this system has been firmly established. So we are in this kind, this new kind of realities, this new kind of political setup with all its consequences. So it took us for years to believe that this kind of uh, reinterpretation of, of historical setup uh, can happen, but it did. And now we try to understand what we are living in and we try to uh, find out how to accommodate. And um, so for those, uh, for whom this uh, system is not large enough, who cannot or who don't feel like uh, inte uh, getting integrated into that, um, it, is, it is really a, um, a, a very uh, a big obstacle to, to, s to see their uh, aspirations uh, realized. Uh, and, it, and it is also true for the performing arts scene I'm more familiar with. Um, just to give you a few uh, numbers for a country of 10 million inhabitants, um, if you want to have some kind of access to public funding or to, um, uh, to possibility to, to, to f go on um, publicly funded stages, you have to go through a registration process. And in this, uh, in this system, we have something like 500 organizations uh, registered, uh, uh, which are f uh, considered as professional organizations, and half of them are uh, theaters. So these 500 uh, organizations are living now in this happy um, reality of the system of national collaboration uh, and waiting somehow uh, how, how the, the, the state will sort out their, uh, their sort and uh, how, so because all those are of course very much depending on these uh, state sub subsidies I was uh, referring uh, for. And it also resulted uh, um, in the in the loss, uh, in, uh, so it, it caused a lot of losses. Um, I can talk about a lost generation, uh, which is actually mine. Um, I lost a lot of friends, because if you don't feel like coping with the system, of course there is one very obvious uh, possibility, is that you leave. And uh, as you might know, uh, some five, more than 500,000 Hungarians left the country the last few years. It's something like 5% uh, of the population. And among them, of course, many, many artists. 
and many uh, theater guys. So all, all the friends I, I, I started with uh, are professional career. They are either uh, put on the margins or working uh, elsewhere in, in Europe, uh, and some of them even uh, migrated and, and left the, uh, the country and plan never come back. Mm. But there are, of course, as always, newcomers, new generations. Martin is one of the, the, the newcomers, but they are all uh, even younger generation uh, coming up. Uh, and, um, and, and for them, uh, it's, it's really a tough question what to, uh, what to choose in this, uh, uh, in at this moment. Um, and I really don't envy them because uh, um, unlike in our case, some 20 years ago, uh, they can just choose about uh, different survival strategies. So how to, how to uh, survive in that, that kind of very rigid uh, uh, system. Um, and it's really quite impossible to make up some longer term life plans or, or, or career plans. Um, but uh, but for some miraculous reason, there are all there, there are always new forces and, and new talents coming up. So uh, when 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 you come and ask uh, whom to meet, uh, what to see, uh, there is still uh, a large offer, and it's also true for the in independent scene. So what what can what can be done in that situation? What what are the the, the lessons learned? Um, I, I would finish on on, on that point. Um, even though we are in a, uh, in a uni university setting, uh, I, I don't feel like teaching or telling you any kind of, of lessons. I ju just can talk about myself and, and uh, about my personal journey. So um, as a, mm, I, I started as a, as a theater manager, and I, I used to run uh, the independent company of uh, Arpad Schilling, which was called uh, uh, Kretaker, and um, some almost 25 years ago. And we were very much interested in, at that time, so it was in the late 90s, early 2000, uh, how to make theater more political and what does it mean to be political in, in within the frame of the, of the theatrical setting that, that, that we knew so well, uh, coming from the uh, university where I'm teaching now, at and, uh, and and so on and um, mm, I I heard very much uh, uh, Professor Schneider uh, when yesterday she remind, uh, <coughs> reminded us that the mission of this gathering and the mission of this uh, institution was also to seek how to humanize uh, politics through the capacities of performing arts so exactly this was this was our uh, research uh, focusing on as well um, and what what uh, and our answer two decades ago were um, what we can do, we can we can uh, we do political theater in order to give an insight, uh, illustrate what's going on, so that people get a sense of, of politics. This was very much fresh and new at that time in in, in Hungary. Um, we can also uh, strive to demask or ridiculize uh, politicians, so that uh, uh, so that they are brought on a human level, and the public can sense that there is not such a big gap between them and the, the leaders. And we can also warn and urge uh, so that people take action before it's too late. And uh, this action somehow has to happen beyond the, the, the performative uh, uh, stage. Um, and um, on that note, if I might, can I, three minutes? Yeah. Uh, just to show you a little, ex ex uh, little part of a video from a show. Uh, and you can please launch the video uh, over there, I will talk while, while you do see. It's, it's in Hungarian, so anyway. Uh, it's a show that we produced in 2002, uh, and it was, it, uh, the title was... Uh, the title was uh, My home, Homeland, My Sweet Homeland. And this performance of Kreta Kerr was presented on the, in the municipal circus of Budapest before an audience of 1,200 people. And it was the... The, the, the first political satire uh, about uh, the, our history after the change of the system. Uh, and uh, the figure that you can see here in, uh, in the white uh, jacket, he was supposed to perform Orban. And it was in 2002, just after uh, the, the end of this first term, when he was so shocked not being re-elected for the second time. Uh, and uh, the, the song is about, uh, do you want 
uh, do you want to, to sacrifice yourself for your country and for your people? And he responds, yes. Unfortunately, I'm the one uh, des designated by the heaven to feel f fulfill this hard job to save my people and to save my country. Uh, and as you can see, it was just after the first uh, of, of his term, uh, after four years of experience, what does it mean to have him and his folks uh, in the administration? Um, so when I, when I find this, uh, re uh, this video yesterday on, on, on YouTube, I was telling to myself, oh, shit, uh, this is uh, really something um, that, that we all would have been taken even more seriously because, uh, because what happens at the end of this uh, little scene that with the help of the church and all these traditionalist, the nationalist uh, 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 forces that we were laughing at at that moment, so what happens that he really rises up into the heaven and, uh, and he situates himself as really the, the, the one who, who saves not only Hungary, but now we know that, that he wants to save uh, Europe as well. And uh, we should be all very much worried about this uh, act of uh, saving us um, uh, against our own will. And uh, so it, it made me very much think about the, 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 the power of the political theater because all those folks walking out of the municipal circus of Budapest and tens of thousands of people came to see that. And also we toured a lot all around Europe with the show. Whether they were warned enough, what would happen if we don't act more fiercely? And the response, of course, absolutely not. We made a total failure because since 2010, he was re-elected now for the third time with two-thirds, uh, which allowed him to reshape the whole country and which allowed him to take his role seriously and seeking for the, the saving uh, and, and, and raising up on a European level. But I don't want to finish uh, talking about uh, th this guy. I, I, I would rather tell you what, uh, what my other uh, thoughts for my or, or advices for myself were so when I when I understood that after 10 years or so as a theater producer I went to other uh, directions and I was very much pleased to hear that many of you made the, the similar uh, journeys in your in your career so I, I became a sort of I became a teacher at the university where I'm really working on how to expand the boundaries of the traditional um, ways of expression of theater and how theater can embrace more than, than just uh, being uh, outspoken even and courageous uh, on the stage. So I, I think that this is, a, this is an important um, uh, pathway for, for all of us who want to reach out more. And the, the other um, mm, option I, I opted for is, uh, is becoming an NGO uh, activist, an NGO leader, and, uh, and I also uh, lead a foundation which uh, works for the uh, for the rights of the Roma population, which is the biggest ethnic minority in Hungary, and um, and uh, which represents uh, a huge. Uh, um, uh, I mean, the situation of the Roma is extremely dangerous, not not only for them and for us, but for the society as a whole and uh, action is needed and all the lessons that we can learn from all the movements that, that your country uh, have known over the past decades are more than uh, insightful for us uh, to learn from bef before it's getting again too late. And that, that's what, we, what leads all of us, I think, here in this room towards more activism, but how to do it wisely and what does it mean in the theater, Martin will tell more about. Thank you. Thank you. Some quick, re some real quick responses down the row here, and then we'll a couple. Of, anybody want to start? You know, I was just going to, if I can take like a couple minutes. I don't know how we're doing on time. I thought it might be interesting just to tag on um, to what Mati said from an American perspective. Sort of, I've, I've had four trips to Hungary. Um, and sort of seeing, and they've all been over the course of this period of time where the political situation has deteriorated. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we have time for this, but I, I can do it really fast. I, I went through my notes 
from all the conversations we had to hear what are the strategies that the government actually uses to dismantle the system, besides the fact that they got elected, theoretically. Um, and because all of them, right now, Hungary sort of leads the world, I think, in this direction. They, they've been at it the longest, and we know that Putin and, and Trump and others, and in Poland, are falling into the same um, strategy. But just really, really quickly, and stop me if this is, uh, uh, this is really geared towards the American audiences, the Americans in the audience, as something to keep our antenna out for. Um, but this is sort of the strategies we learned about. They basically dismantled all of the funding structures um, for the arts to create confusion and unpredictability. And they've done that in all different facets of Hungarian life, but basically all the structures that were in place are now dismantled. And what Mati said, um, I, don't, I shouldn't quote you, but he said basically this makes a good situation for the spider in the middle of the web. It, it, sowing confusion and, and just uh, you know, unpredictability. Um, we know that that, that is a, a basic Trump strategy. He appoints people to head agencies who don't know what they're doing, don't know anything about the field, um, you know, and, and who do bizarre things. Number two, they eliminate channels for dialogue between the artistic fields and the government. Um, and we heard about that all the time, that the space for, active, for, uh, for dialogue and for uh, even activism just gets shrunk to basically nothing. I'll go really fast. They've created parallel structures to the official structures. So I've thought about this with Trump all the time. Like for example, there's a whole parallel justice system for important public cases, which r has a different set of rules than the, than the normal everyday justice system. Um, there's for example, creating a whole new national authority university that's sort of training the whole next generation of artists to fall in line uh, behind, uh, behind the goals of the Fidesz. Uh, movement. So th there's a few strategies. They, they've more recently started to denounce objectionable works to d in, in, the, in the party uh, newspapers in order to dissuade audiences from attending and thereby induce a kind of self-censorship on the part of the artists. A very famous recent example was a production of Billy Elliot where the party newspaper said this could basically uh, cause young people to turn gay. Um, or something like that, and you shouldn't go go to see it. Um, they they are creating. They're trying to create a new cultural elite of artists affiliated with the party and its point of view. So this is parallel to what they've done in the media, where now 70 to 80 or 90 percent, I think, of the media outlets are basically owned by um, Orban Orban affiliates. Um, but in the in the theater world, basically, they replaced all the artistic leaders of all of the provincial theaters um, and of the national theater who now do work that falls in line with the Hungary First um, um, uh, policies and have essentially created what, what somebody referred to us as an elite of shared grievances. So this really resonates to me as an American. It's like, oh, before Fidesz, these progressive liberals were controlling all of the theaters and the, the leadership of them and only allowing, and now that we're in control, uh, with the, uh, we can put all these other artists in place even though those artists aren't very good and their work is, is not very good, but it's like because they'll fall in line with the party ideology in terms of the kind of work they'll do, they become a new elite which has a shared grievance against the old, the old elite. This list goes on. Um, they, they're trying to create a new canon of both old and new works which are considered new models of excellence and those are in line with the the slogan of of Fidesz of their last election which was Hungary first obviously that's something we recognize but for example they've commissioned a, a mega new work about King Matthias how do you pronounce King Matthias famous Hungarian king from I believe the 15th century um, and basically uh, new interpretations of any problematic periods in Hungarian history, in particular the period between 1945 and 1989, where Hungary is now recast, and this includes big monuments on major city squares, Hungary is now recast as the blameless victim and, and doesn't have to look, in, look at whether they played any role, um, any complicity with respect to the Holocaust. Uh, Mati referenced the, the recent United States tour. There's a whole new Hungarian Academy of Arts that gives lifelong stipends to members, mostly older white Christian men, um, um, who, uh, who are now you know, anointed as part of the new canon, um, but they don't really need to do any new work. 
And then the other thing that they're really, really good at, and we'll recognize this as a, Trump, as a strategy that Trump and, and Putin has also stolen, of really taking advantage of opportunities that present themselves to kind of reinforce the desired ideology and program. Um, so um, an example of that is that they recently, there was recently some corruption cases that from what I understand, it's hard to get to the bottom of these things, related mostly to these large folk dance companies that were on tour and there were accusations of embezzlement and corruption. But as a result of that, they dismantled the entire funding system. Those folk dance companies are still the ones getting all the big money, but that crisis creates an excuse to essentially eliminate funding from the independent and problematic companies that are doing the work that's pushing back against the, um, the, against the government. So um, it's, uh, the list is longer, but these are all things to have our antenna out because they start slowly and then they basically take the whole system over. Blair? Well, I'm going to be very quick, but I want to um, uh, actually pick up on where Howard just, just led us. I think one of the questions around a panel like this is why should we care about this story? And I want to make a couple of points, and Howard really pointed uh, in the same direction I'm, I'm going to go. I mean, obviously, the situation in Hungary is somewhat idiosyncratic. Uh, we're talking about a small country, 10 million people. We're talking about um, a, a country and a theater community embedded in a uh, culture with a difficult language, which in some ways can uh, reinforce isolation. Uh, there is an unusual dependency on the centralized state for funding. Uh, there's a weak civil society, weak legal in, uh, institutions. Uh, so sitting here, we could dismiss all of this, but as Howard just said, Orban has created a map uh, for other uh, populist, nationalist, uh, quasi-authoritarian regimes, and I think uh, we see that this map has, has been used, either consciously or unconsciously. Um, and it's not just, uh, it, it, it's in many countries, very similar patterns are emerging in Poland, for example, or around the Polish uh, theatrical community. Uh, it's important to note that this is not full-blown authoritarianism. Um, as you noted, people aren't being taken out into the forest. What he's actually been able to demonstrate is that, that a regime can, in fact, secure its social and ideological goals without necessarily uh, resorting to coercive brute force. You sow confusion, you create false crises, you define a heroic past, uh, which is a very important part of it, and then the goal becomes to return to that past to overcome the, the, the number of different crises which you yourself have created. Um, and uh, all the while blowing on the dog whistles of grievance. And grievance is a really important part of the story here. Uh, converting your supporters into historical victims. Victims of some impersonal faraway elite. And, uh, and then you wrap it up with fake religiosity. And uh, I, I think uh, this is a roadmap which is being followed in many places. Orban has been uh, a leader uh, and, and he's been successful at this. And I think what this panel begins to highlight are some of the ways in which theater can respond. And, but to respond, it becomes important to push beyond traditional boundaries. And I think that uh, what we're going to hear in a moment also uh, points in that direction. So um, I, I, it is a small story that's far away, that may seem irrelevant, but I think actually what we're hearing about is a roadmap that stands at the center for a number of events taking place in the world. And just to pick one example out of many, we can think about what's happening in the state of Georgia uh, not too far from here, right now, today. So um, this is an important, I think, uh, lesson for everybody. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just listening and 
so many things sound similar between Hungary and Russia, obviously. Russia is a bit more on steroids, kind of. They actually take people to forests, you know, and there is a bit more money. So that's that's part of that. But also, the, I, I, f I feel like the next stage comparing to, to what you're talking about is we, we started to lose logic. We started to, like, it's very hard to, you know, it's very hard to say what is what is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do by now. It's, it's, it's there is no way, you know, people who, like, we, we we're in the year, Russia is in the year of theater right now, which means a lot of interest of um, authorities to the theater more than anything else. So people get, you know, people get arrested, people get to prisons, people, get, you know, theaters get searched, but it's very hard to, it's very hard to grasp on any kind of specific logic on this behavior of the authorities. And that's what scares me the most in the place where we are. Uh, it's actually more complicated even than the Soviet repressive measures. When you knew, when, when you pretty much knew where you were crossing the red line. Uh, we're in the place where we don't know anymore. I wonder, you know, does it resonate with Hungary at all? Thank you. We're going to jump very quickly and then do questions at the end because we're slipping for time here. The good news, if any of you spent five nights going to theater in Budapest, my bet would be you'd see better theater per night in that town still than uh, any other city that I know. I'm always stimulated, excited, and I've really been watching this young man who, when I first met him five years ago, was just starting his company. Uh, he has really made a name for himself both inside of Hungary and he's also getting a European uh, profile. He's been here twice. He's very. He likes America. He came to Baltimore to create a, uh, a, a version of his promenade piece where 45 people get on a bus with headphones, a story being played and told and sung through the headphones while wisps of theater, semi kinds of theater events seem to happen outside the bus. That opened in Baltimore and it uh, then a year later in Albuquerque, two totally different versions. The Albuquerque production has just reopened last week for another month. They brought that back after the winter. And the great good fortune that Martin and I both had was when we were able to, the first time I met Danielle, I said, I'd really like to put you on an airplane. And I finally was able to, and she went to uh, Budapest and called me up when she got back saying, well, I wasn't shopping or looking for anything, but boy. And the boy is this incredible piece called Addressless. It's about the homeless. It's game theater. And they're going to share with us, they're inviting us into the kitchen. They're in the middle of the first 13 day, can we do this? Where's this going to go? Uh, and I'm always fascinated if I can peek in that early, uh, and it's with great generosity that they're both here. Daniela Topal from the Rattlestick Playwrights Theater, ER, and uh, Martin Boros, the founder of Stereo Act. It's up to you guys. Thank you so much. I'm glad being here. I just wanted to add to the previous presentation that if I were a spy of the Hungarian government, then Mate would be in a great trouble because his interpretation was pretty accurate, but gladly I'm not a spy. So I guess now uh, from the macro image, we are zooming in a little bit and talk a little bit about the micro. Um, um, so I'd like to introduce you our theater called Stereo Act really briefly and then um, together with Daniela we'd like to tell you about the concept of this upcoming collaboration called Addressless. So again, um, my name is Martin Boros, I'm the artistic director of Stereo Act. Stereo Act is a contemporary theater collective based in Budapest. Um, we founded it in 2013, so this was our sixth um, season now. We claim to be a progressive theater regarding our methods and uh, approaches and model and um, um, our structure. Uh, this is not an ensemble, though. 
uh, despite of the fact that you see a bunch of nice people. So they are the ones that we collaborated uh, with in 2018 and 19. Uh, we were project-based um, with a bigger circle of artists, uh, always depending on the needs of the given concept. So sometimes we work more with actors, musicians, or dancers, or visual artists. In the last couple of years, we produced uh, 14 theater shows, ones on stage and ones that are site-specific or happened in public space. And also we produced a documentary movie and various artistic actions such as flash mobs and civil campaigns. All the works we do are uh, based on an original concept. They are all post-dramatic and interdisciplinary devised performances. And music, text, interaction, movement, image, games are equally important components in our creation processes. We often use participatory interactive forms in our productions. Um, and we constantly experiment with the unconventional positioning of the audience in our pieces. We also regularly involve civilian participants, um, experts or everyday people, uh, in either in the creation process or on stage, or sometimes both. Um, plus, um, we often use uh, documentary materials and, um, and we work mostly on social and political issues uh, or, or community themes. Uh, we work internationally. Uh, this is a list of places we worked in the past few years um, on collaborations, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, Spain, Poland, and obviously uh, the US. One of the main um, milestone of the US collaboration was the promenade that Philip mentioned. Uh, this is an image from the original Budapest version back from 2013. Um, and this is an image from the Baltimore version. And the newest one we just premiered last November, uh, the Promenade Albuquerque. And the reason why we are here is addressless. Uh, or Vagabond Draw Game, or as we refer to it, uh, it's an interactive theatrical table game on homelessness. Uh, we premiered it in 2016, and um, let's, let's watch a short video, and then I'll tell you more about it. Just a sec, I will restart it. A cím nélkül egy színházi társas játék, amelyben a nézők csapatokat alkotva irányítják a történet három szereplőjét, akik különböző okokból elvesztették otthonukat. Budapesti hajléktalanként egy sor olyan nehézséggel szembesülnek, amik egy átlag ember számára teljesen ismeretlenek. Ezekben a helyzetekben a nézők hoznak döntéseket, és irányítják a szereplőink sorsát. Meg kell küzdeniük a napi betevőért, szállás helyet kell találniuk, szembe kell nézniük időjárási viszontagságokkal, szenvedélybetegségekkel, koldus maffiával és a társadalom előítéleteivel is. Kérjük az önkormányzatot! hogy a hajléktalanok utcáról és a környékről történő végleges eltávolítása ügyében a hajléktalanok intézkedjék. A cél, hogy hőseink egy saját albérletben új életet kezdhessenek. I'm not sure if it was possible to read it. Were you able to read the subtitles? Okay. So... We opened this in 2016 and we played so far over 40 times. Um, also for adult paying audience as a repertory production. And also like half of the times we take it to high schools to, uh, to, high schools to, to play together with students. 
Uh, it's played by four people, two professional actors, one social worker and a homeless activist. Um, and um, yeah, as you could see, probably there are the audience forms groups and um, together with their theme based on consensus that they make after each um, scenes, they have to guide or assist the life of their fictitious homeless character throughout all these challenges. Um, the social worker is a game leader, plus also someone, an expert on stage, an authentic person who can give us uh, information about uh, this unknown word uh, and provide authentic authenticity, um, just, uh, just like the homeless character who basically plays himself. Um, and um, yeah, I'd like to read out a really short uh, quote from the piece that could give you an idea what the role of the social worker is uh, in this game. In our society, if we see a homeless person on the street, we typically think, why don't he go to the shelter? Instead of asking, why has he no place to live? In the meantime, the Hungarian system supposedly caring for the homeless reminds one of the disaster relief. As if there were a city that predictably gets flooded every year, but instead of building a dam, people are offered life vests. Um, we chose two quotes. I chose this one because um, this is a good example for um, um, a humanitarian and a very personal theme, how it becomes macro immediately when we start to talk about uh, the responsibility of the community. And I truly believe that this piece is something that is a status report on our society and challenges those stereotypes that state that uh, if you are poor, you should blame yourself and everybody worth as much as you earn. Uh, and this, at this point, I'd like to invite Daniela to, to join us. And if you'd like to read the other I'd quote. I'd love to. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is another excerpt from the piece. And then we'll talk about sort of what our work here in New York is. Um, I'm sure you all know the game of musical chairs. The players run around empty chairs, and at a given sign, they have to sit down on a chair. But there's always one chair fewer than there are players, so whoever ends up standing will lose. If we use that game as a simile for being homeless, the players are people with low incomes, and the chairs are the flats they can afford. In real life, if you remain standing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're slower or less clever than the others, or because you're sick or have family issues, but it comes from the system, from not having enough chairs or enough affordable flats to begin with. So I was fortunate enough to um, be invited to the Duna Park Festival, care of our angel, Philip Arnaud. Um, I was not intending to do anything um, with all the amazing work that I had seen, except once I um, walked into the room and I experienced address lists, and I thought about um, where I live in New York, and actually I thought about all the cities I've lived in um, in the US. I was thinking just how incredibly relevant this project is. Um, Rattlestick is a small theater based in the West Village. We look at the intersectionality of relevant and ambitious work with um, community gathering um, and I would say justice. And um, what I really responded to was just how this piece does all of those things. Um, and so Fast forward, um, we were fortunate enough to receive a couple of grants and we have, um, Martin is paired up with a beautiful playwright named Jonathan Payne. Um, he is also New York based. Um, his day job is to work for community access that works in social services. Um, he's also an incredible playwright by night, by weekend. He's gonna have a world premiere at Williamstown this summer. He's at Juilliard right now but he sort of straddles both worlds and um, is uniquely suited to partner with Martin. Um, another key partner is Katie Pearl, um, and she is a director and a dramaturg and a thinker um, in many expansive ways and has been a key partner. Um, and so they are in the middle of a 10-day residency in New York, 
Um, and they are meeting with a lot of different organizations like Picture the Homeless, the Coalition for the Homeless, um, the, the Door. They are talking to individuals and community groups. They are going on food vans. They are investigating the ways that the piece needs to be adapted from its uh, root in Budapest um, and the ways in which it doesn't need to be adapted at all because the challenges of homelessness are universal in many different ways. And so I think that's been a really interesting journey. We have a really big thought about this piece that is really intended to sort of travel in a shopping cart, which is that how can we create a version of this piece that can go to different cities, San Francisco and Philadelphia, and there are a number of cities that are already very interested in this, and that we can then um, take a local component um, and pull in sort of the specific nature of what it means to be homeless in San Francisco, say, or Philadelphia, but also um, the universal piece as a whole. So I've, I've never experienced anything quite like this, and I'm really blown away by the artistic collaborators, but also the like deep, urgent need to like get in a room together and talk about this subject and use theater as a vehicle to do that. Why don't we open it up to questions either about either half of this because we went a little long and I don't think you want to sit there quietly. So, yes, sir. Do we have mics? They'll get you a mic. I think this addressless piece, by the way, should be seen in every city in America. And we're... Here we go. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, Hungary is a, a template for things that are going on elsewhere in Europe. We have European elections coming up. Um, we have uh, Russia as a, a threat to, to, to the Europe. Um, what's the role of uh, philanthropy? We're here uh, partly through the support of the Trust for Mutual Understanding. What's the role of philanthropy in supporting theater and the arts um, in Hungary, in other places where um, theater and the arts are subject to uh, co-option, coercion, repressive uh, measures? Um, well, mm, it's, um, it's, it's a difficult question because I think it's one that has been repeatedly uh, uh, asked uh, over the la since, since the change of the system, so since the Berlin Wall came down and it's 30 years now. And uh, I, I, I saw pretty well the, 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 the function of all these corporations and all these, uh, um, all these uh, very... Uh, evident uh, signs of solidarity and cooperation uh, in the first one, one and a half decade after the change of the system. So we, 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 it was a huge help, not only financially, but of course it was also, but, but it helped Hungary somehow, and I think all the other uh, Eastern Central European countries uh, to reintegrate into the, um, into the Western um, uh, civilization or this, this uh, uh, this uh, yeah, this world we, we we used to belong to, and I think it was really um, important for 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 all of us uh, who had the chance to cooperate on um, uh, on on productions, on tours, on residencies, on um, on uh, all kind of um, mutual uh, experiences, exchange programs um, to. Um, to regain this self-confidence and also to feel ourselves at home uh, in Europe and in the Western culture. But I think there was a turning point in 2004 when Hungary joined uh, with, with the other uh, former communist countries, the, e the EU, and a lot of uh, institutions uh, thought, and we also <laughs> from within, that uh, now a new uh, period will, would open and it's now our business uh, to take care about ourselves. 
So what happened that, that many of these uh, foundations and uh, foreign institutes turned um, or withdrew, uh, and, and they did rightfully so because there are so many other difficult places in the world and so much to, do, to be done. Um, and I think it was not a, uh, not a far too optimistic uh, um, forecast uh, to say that, that now we can take care about ourselves. And, um, and the fact that it absolutely did not happen and things uh, turned back after 2010 and, and it, it got even worse, in a, of course, in a very different way than it, it used to be uh, before 89, um, puts the same institutions in, in a very delicate position because they cannot get back to the routines that they used to have um, in the 90s. And, um, and I think it's anyway, it's impossible because they are also elsewhere with other priorities or, or with other possibilities. But the sheer intervention into these countries like, like, like Hungary is not possible anymore while, while any uh, support or participation or contribution from uh, French, British, American uh, partners were m most more than welcome and, and very supportive uh, in, in those decades. Now they all became suspicious and even dangerous in, in sometimes. Um, <coughs> so uh, just to mention the, 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 the biggest uh, example of that, uh, a major uh, player in, uh, in the civil society slash independent cultural ground used to be the Open Society Foundations of George Soros. And, uh, and the fact that they last year they decided to close down the Budapest office, which used to be a sort of headquarters I also used to work at, uh, and they left, um, and they left in a sort of urgency. So they left behind everything without setting up new structures, which will open in Berlin I maybe in a few years. But it shows how impossible it is today to operate within normal conditions uh, in, 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 our, in our sector. And it's very mm, alarming for all of us who stayed in the country. And I think it's a big task to find out for all those who are still willing to come uh, and work with us or to, to, to be solidarity with us. I have a question because nobody's heard my voice yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, um, it's on. Uh, I wonder, it's like sort of the, the pull the camera back to the occasion of a global gathering like this. It's a little, like just the, a question about how or whether um, folks working in not necessarily identical situations, but how the, the, the awareness perhaps of like um, entities that can sort of say we have, you know, I know that that we have, a, we have, a, we are noticing what's happening where you are. There are connections across. Just for any of you to kind of comment, we have the sort of specifics of Hungary, the relationships across Europe, and then kind of wider global relationships where we're seeing kind of not synonymous but analogous kinds of things happening. And are there practical ways to be thinking about what it means to have artists coming together from different parts of the world? We have obviously some amazing artist rights organizations that are, you know, working in a range of ways. But just to sort of like, um, you know, it's kind of the what can we do together question, if any of you want to comment on that. was asking me because I'm not part of the theater community so uh, what I'm going to say may just seem uh, totally off base but I think um, one of the important parts of the Orban story is as it was playing out um, just had more information about it been made available uh, it might have helped uh, prepare others elsewhere uh, for some of these political movements and moments. I think, I know how, how Round has been very, um, uh, played an important role in just communicating information. So I think, I think that that's part of the story and a general uh, understanding uh, that um, What's happening in a place like Hungary may seem irrelevant to what's happening here, 
but we need to be a little bit more sensitive to the fact that uh, there are global trends out there and, and share information. I think exchanges, I think the work that we see uh, being done uh, in, in New York in this particular case is a good example. I think uh, university-based programs uh, uh, can maybe reach out to other uh, parts of the university where there are, where there's expertise in specific um, areas and, and kind of mobilize it. But I, I, I think there's just a need for a greater awareness. And, um, you know, you, you talked about how when the EU expanded, we thought game over. You know, we've wrapped up uh, Eastern Europe and we put a nice bow on it and we can all walk away now because it's an EU problem. And um, it's, it's not. We have to understand that we're talking about ongoing political trends and we need to th be thoughtful about how to engage uh, with them. I'm not sure how helpful that is because I'm outside the community, but. Um, I just wanted to add, I th you know, one of the things that I've picked up in, in several of my trips is that the sometimes the status of the artist as an international figure, it gives them a little bit of inoculation within their own uh, culture. I'm not sure if that's always true. And, but I, what I'm saying, that kind of, and I think that's true in Russia, um, uh, and, I, and I think that's working a little bit that way in Hungary, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I feel like maybe with Rabi El Fodi, it works where an artist who has a high enough stature almost can um, can uh, be a model for pushing the envelope just a little bit. Um, but I think it points to the importance of the witnessing that we do. I don't think we travel enough. I don't think we see theater in other countries enough. I don't think we do enough to kind of give status to one another's work around the world. And I think there's there's some there's some value to just that kind of witnessing. It, it's only a small number of artists who become international superstars, um, and especially artists coming from repressive uh, regimes. But I do think that our our witnessing and reporting on what we see, um, local governments uh, watch that. They they note that, and they see that artists have a have a standing in the world, and it, I think it makes a difference. You hear me? Yeah, the bad news for me is when I look at the countries where I spend most of my time, uh, they're self-describing their artistic communities as being detached. No, 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 we're not getting in there. Uh, and, you know, the air smells bad. Uh, it's dangerous. But Earlier this week in New York, I sat down with uh, uh, the new director of CEC Arts Link and there are 10 uh, young artists from Eastern Europe that are coming to America and they get placed in different places and they have self-descriptions, self-describers. And out of 10 of them, they I'm a photographer, a writer, and an activist. I'm an actor, a playwright, and an activist. Eight out of 10 self-defined as activists. And that gives me some hope inside. And then the other thing that just continues to make me want to get up and keep doing all of this is the level of work that you see in those conditions that continues to get creatives. It's astonishing and brave uh, and that, you know, that, that that ecology can survive. When I saw the fifth year celebration, Martin produced all of his work uh, except one in the last uh, five years. It's, I'd put it any place on any festival stage anywhere. So it does, at the end of the day, get down to the work. So I thank you all. I thank you folks for taking the time out of the work. And a great salute to uh, Georgetown and the global, this gathering. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you all for sharing that um, uh, amazing Windows in with us. Just um, quick updates. You're at a you're at a break now. 
Um, we have a really jam-packed f like 4 to 5.30 period. So you actually get a nice little coffee break here, but I urge you to come back at 4 sharp. Everything will be in this space. We have um, Alex Aaron with Amir uh, Nazar Zawabi via vi video link with the extraordinary project Grey Rock, and then we have the work around um, uh, Prisons and Justice Initiative and the Graduates and Incarceration and other beautiful performances all in about a kind of an hour and a half period. Um, just a couple updates on tickets and things for tonight. Mix and Match, the On Guard Arts piece that's at six, um, is technically full and you might be on a waiting list. But we want to, based on sort of patterns of, we could call it attrition, or we could call it just people having moving in all the circles they're moving in as they connect with each other, I think it's likely that some of the people we have on the list may not, if you're eager to get in, we urge you to come to the door, because we think we'll be able to let some more people into that, which is down in 035. And then there are seats available for all of the other performances tonight, and it's an amazing set of performances, um, Evening with an Immigrant and Oranges and Stones, and How to Have Fun in a Civil War. So, um, so get your seats. Uh, so